Joshua chapter 3, Joshua chapter 3, uh, we, in a series of messages entitled, In God We Trust. Today we'll be wrapping up the last part of this series of messages entitled, In God We Trust. Somebody say, In God We Trust. Say it again like you believe it. In God We Trust. Now make it personal. In God I Trust. We've been talking for several weeks about the importance of the foundation in the scripture, how God does not want me to just trust him, but God wants me to put my trust in him. Say that after me. God doesn't want me just to trust him, but God wants me to put my trust in him. We talked about last Sunday about Ephesians, uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19 where Apostle Paul had to have this amazing understanding and revelation where he said, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus in heaven. Paul had this understanding that it was God, his father, that was his supplier. He did not look to people. He did not look to society. He did not look to the government. He didn't have his trust in things, but he put his trust in God. And we said last week that only somebody that has a relationship with God, that has put their trust in God, can God become the supplier to their very essence of all of their needs. Paul said this to that church. He said, my God shall supply all of your needs. This was a very important statement that he was making because he was establishing where his supply, who is his source, who is going to help, who's going to solve, who's going to fix, who's going to take care of things. And this is where Paul made this profound statement that my God will be your supplier. See, God wants to be the very source, the very essence the very supplier of my joy, my peace, of everything I got going on in my life. He doesn't want things to be my source, people to be my source, circumstance to be my source. God wants to be the very essence of my supplier in every area I need. Matthew chapter 6 says that if I will seek first the kingdom of God, then all those things He will be added unto me. He was laying down the foundational principle that if I will put God first in my life, put all my trust in God, and make sure I don't have it in other things, he said, then all the things will be added to you. We can look to see that if I put my trust in things, if I put my trust in people, if I put my trust in circumstance, those things can fail. Those things can change. People change. I change. You change. Circumstances change. It might have been going this way, and before you know it, it immediately changes for a whole nother direction. See, God don't want me to put my trust in those things because then those things is what I'm going to be looking after. Those things have my attention. Those things will be what I'm most concerned about. He wants me to put God first. He says, if you'll seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, then all those other things you're concerned about, they'll automatically be added. See, if I'm going to put my trust in God, then God wants me to put him first. Put him first in my life. Put him first in my desires. God, I only want it to work out because you said it can work out. I only want things to turn in my favor because you said you're going to turn it in my favor. I don't want anything selfish of myself. I don't want anything of my own thoughts, my own feelings. God, I'm putting my trust in you. Many times we may think our trust is in God. Many times we may think we are trusting God in our situation. But our trust in God doesn't mean I'm just going all out for God. It means I'm all in. And if I'm all in, I'm going to go all out. But you'll never go all out for God unless you're first all in. Somebody say all in. In other words, he says you got to be all in before you can ever go all out. Many times people are trying to go all out. They're trying to be who God wants them to be. They're trying to follow God's plan. But see, if I don't first make a decision that I'm first going all in, 
I'm selling out. I'm losing sight of myself. I'm losing sight of my feelings. I'm losing thought of my opinion. I'm going all in with God. It's either his way or there's no way at all. God, I only want your will to be done in my life. I don't even want my will to be done. God, I want your will to be done. See, once I put my trust in him, then I'm giving him permission to be Lord of my life. God doesn't want to just be Savior. God wants to be Lord. He wants to be the one put in position to be the conductor and the organizer and the ruler of my heart. He wants to be the one who I ask first, who I get permission from first, who I seek first, because that lets God know you're more interested in what I say on the circumstance than what somebody else says on the circumstance. You're more interested in having your trust in me, trust in what I say, trust in my plan than what somebody else told you you should do. See, if I will put God first, he says, if you'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That word righteousness means God's way of doing things. If I put God first in my life and what should matter most to me is God, I want it the way you would want it done. I'm seeking you first and your way of doing things. That matters most to me. It's the top of my agenda. That's the thing I pursue the most is God because I can put my trust in you because you said in Psalms that there's not one good thing that you would withhold from me, those that love you. See, God will never withhold anything good that he has for you and me. God will never allow you to go through anything you can't handle. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, God will never allow you to be tested, tried above your ability of handling. So whatever you're going through, whatever's going on, he says, you can handle this. You got this because I'm going to help you through this situation. I'm going to be everything you need. I'm going to be your supplier in this. And if you'll just put your trust in me. See, the only way people could fail me is if I had my trust in them. The only way I could be disappointed in life is if I had my hope or my dream or whatever I desired in the situation, in the circumstance, in the very thing. You see, God doesn't want me to have my trust in him. God wants me to, God doesn't want me to have my trust in them. God wants me to have my trust in him. Somebody say amen. amen. Leviticus 19, we read this last week and it bears repeating. Verse four says, do not put your trust in idols, or make metal images of gods for yourselves. For I am the Lord your God. He says, don't put your trust in those things. Don't make images. Don't set idols out there. You put your trust in me because I am the Lord your God. We read Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25. And it says, worry weighs a person down but an encouraging word cheers a person up. We talked about last Sunday how worry is a satanic weapon that the enemy uses to strip one of all trust, to strip one of all belief, to get one out of trusting God and get one into fearing their situation. In other words, he says, worry is gonna only weigh you down but if you will put your trust in the Lord because an encouraging word lifts a person up. See, worry is a satanic trap. It comes to kill, it comes to steal, it comes to destroy. Somebody say worry, worry. is a killer. God don't want me to worry about anything, but he wants me to trust him in all things. Worry is a thief, it is a killer. We listed several things about worry last Sunday. We said, number one, worry is a killer. Number two, we said, worry sabotages your desires. Worry will sabotage your desire, your desire to trust God, your desire to follow God, your desire to live for God. Worry, because people that worry are always afraid to take a step of faith. They will live in fear. They'll let a spirit of fear get control of them. And the Bible says that God has not given me a spirit of fear, but he has given me a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. Amen. Number three, we said worry is an enemy of my faith. See, faith in Hebrews chapter six is faith is what pleases God the most. 
God's more pleased about my trusting in him, about me stepping out in faith to do what he says to do, to follow his instructions and put my trust in his plan than even relying on my own plan or even listen to my best friend's plan. Amen. You know, everybody has other plans than what God says. Everybody has their own opinion. But I have to make sure that others' opinions line up with God's opinion. I have to make sure my thoughts are God's thoughts. Amen. Number four, we said worry is an enemy to trust. And number five, we said worry will cause me to live with closed hands and a closed heart. Worry will cause somebody to live with closed hands and a closed heart. Scripture says, whatever my hand finds to do is going to be blessed. The God God will bless the very fruit of my hands. He will cause what my hands touch to be blessed. And if you begin to worry, you'll never want to take a step of faith. You'll never want to step out. You'll never want to believe again. You'll never dream again. You'll always live in less than what God has best for you. In Joshua chapter 3, we ended last Sunday, and I want to start here and finish today. In Joshua chapter 3 and verse 5, God talks about the blessing of trusting. Somebody say, the blessing of trusting. There's a blessing in my trusting. Say that out loud with me. There's a blessing in my trusting. In other words, there is a blessing wrapped up in my trusting in God. The more I put my trust in God, there is a blessing that is released in my life. There's a manifold blessing of wisdom, of faith, of abundance, of healing when I put my trust in God. In Joshua 3 In verse 5, he says, consecrate yourselves, or another King James says, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow God is going to do amazing things. And we ended last week talking about how Joshua was talking to the children of Israel. Here they're about to cross the Jordan to the promised land that they have spent 40 years in the wilderness. Now here, they're closer than they've ever been. They're further than they've ever been. And right before they cross over to possess the very promised land that God has promised them that they were searching for, that they were believing for, that they were dreaming of, right before they get ready to cross over, God tells Joshua, consecrate. Get yourself fully devoted to what God is about to do because every time God is about to do something amazing in your life, the enemy will come with destructive thoughts, destructive plans, chaos, confusion, worry, doubt, unbelief. He will try to cause the biggest mess, the biggest chaos he can right before God does something amazing. Sad to say, many times the enemy trips us up right when we're closer to our miracle, closer to our breakthrough than we've ever been before. In other words, we have been putting our trust in God all the way through the journey, and right when we're about to receive the reward, the enemy knows you're closer than you've ever been. You're further than you've ever been. And I've learned this in my life and my walk with God that every time the tree starts to shake, every time a ruckus starts to happen, I need to hold on, buckle my seatbelt, put my chin strap on, get my armor on, get ready because the enemy is trying to deceive, devour, and destroy. He's trying to separate, he's trying to conquer, and I gotta get my trust back in God. I gotta make sure that I'm all in and I'm ready to go all out. Somebody say, all in in. and gonna go all out. In other words, if I'm going all in, then nobody else's opinion, nobody else's plan, nobody else's thoughts can matter most to me. I want God's thoughts, I want God's way, I want God's opinion. See here, Joshua was telling the people, tomorrow God is about to do something amazing. 
But what our role is today is not just get caught up on tomorrow, but let's pay attention to today. Because if I don't recognize what time it is and don't pay attention to my today, because however I treat today is gonna show up in my tomorrow. If I mishandle today, I'll mishandle tomorrow. And if I mishandle tomorrow, I'll mishandle the next day. See, here's what Joshua was not telling the children of Israel. Put your trust in tomorrow. See, he was saying today, tomorrow, God is going to do something amazing. But let's not focus on tomorrow. Let's get focused on today. Let's consecrate ourselves. I looked up the word consecration. It means to be fully devoted into something. To be all in, full devotion of dethroning of oneself, but enthroning of something else. Here we could say is, I'm dethroning my thoughts, but I'm enthroning God's thoughts. When he was telling them to consecrate yourself, sanctify yourself. Sanctification can only come by the cleansing and the washing of the blood of Jesus. But even if you take the word to sanctify oneself, it means to clean oneself. It means to purify oneself. It means to get rid of your thoughts, get rid of your opinion, get rid of your feelings, get rid of how you feel, what's going on, your worries, your doubts, your disbeliefs, and get it all into God. Get Put it all in something. And here Joshua was telling the people, get ready, because tomorrow God's going to do something amazing. See, there's many times in my life I was so focused on next week, next month, next year that I wasn't doing anything with the here and now. In other words, everything that I thought about was later. Therefore, it caused me to lose passion and lose desire about today. Because what the enemy will come in to do, if you're only living for the future, if you're only thinking about tomorrow, the enemy will come and camp in your life and get you focused on today. And if you're not careful about what's going on today, if anything wrong happens today, it will cause you to lose desire about tomorrow. It'll cause you to mishandle your thoughts about tomorrow because we let today destroy our thoughts about tomorrow. See, the only way I can handle tomorrow is I got to learn to handle today. It's not that one day, Lord, I want to put my trust in you. Lord, I hope one day I'm able to be better. No, it starts today. It starts right here, right now. We draw a line in the sand. God, I'm not waiting on what tomorrow brings. I'm going to put my trust in you today. I'm deciding from this day forward, I don't want you just to be Savior. I want you to be the Lord of my life. See, God wants tomorrow to happen faster than you want tomorrow to happen. But God can't release tomorrow if I'm mishandling today. I'll say that again. God cannot release tomorrow if today's overwhelming me. If today's got my attention. If today's got me caught up. If today's got me worried. He wants me to learn how to handle today. See, if I put my trust in him today, then he knows I'll have my trust in him tomorrow. But if I'm only waiting for tomorrow to happen, I'm going to mishandle the opportunities he gives me today. Today's the day I start. Today's the day I say, Lord, above it all and through it all, I'm putting my trust in you today. This is the day the Lord has made. This is the day I'm going to choose to rejoice. This is the day I'm going to be glad in. I choose to make the best of today. I'm going to let tomorrow worry about itself. I'm going to let next week worry about itself. I'm going to enjoy my today because what am I going to do tomorrow? I'm going to get up and treat tomorrow like I treated today. What am I going to do after that? I'm going to treat the next day the way I treated the day before. Amen. In other words, how I handle today is how I'm going to handle tomorrow. That's why Joshua was telling the people. That's why the Lord told Joshua, now go tell them. What I'm about to do tomorrow, it requires devotion today. It requires being all in so you could go all out tomorrow. If you don't get all in today, you won't be going all out tomorrow. So many times we wonder why 
is it not happening? Why is it not turning? Why is it not working out? Is God only do it for special people? Is God only answer certain prayers for certain people? No, God treats every one of us the same. Every one of us the same. We're all equal in the eyes of God. He's put a measure of faith, the Bible says, on the inside of each one of us. And it's what we do with that measure of faith that we start believing here, believing there. And the more we exercise that faith, the more that faith begins to get strong. Somebody say amen. You know, many people, when God calls us to go all in and to go all out, and to put God first in our lives, that our trust is in him, our trust is what he thinks. Many people have mistakenly misunderstood what it means to be all in, what it means to follow Jesus. Somehow people mistakenly under, misunderstand and now they're asking Jesus to follow them. See, am I following Jesus or am I asking Jesus to follow me? In other words, here's the fastest way to realize, are you truly following Jesus or are you wanting Jesus to follow you? Is your prayer more about his plan in your life or your plan? Is your desires more his desires for your life or is it more your desires for your life? Are you going to church to please yourself because when you don't go, you don't feel good. So I got to get to the house of the Lord because I ain't last time I had a bad day when I didn't go. Are you more interested about what's going on with you or more interested what's going on with him? In other words, are, is Jesus being asked to follow you or are you following him? The story in Matthew 19, I'm going to paraphrase it, is a story of the rich young ruler. Many people are very familiar with it, and if not, for the sake of time, you have to go and read it in Matthew chapter 19. You can read it later. And it talks about the story of the rich young ruler where he was there with Jesus and all the disciples. And Jesus began to talk about the life and eternal life with God. And the rich young ruler here had all the wealth, all the riches, had everything man could ever dream of. But he was missing one thing. And that was eternal life that it could only come through what Jesus Christ can give. Here this man began to say, and Jesus began to list all the things that man should not do to be able to be at peace and be in God's will. And the rich young ruler began to say, I've done all those things. In other words, I don't do anything wrong. But you know, sometimes you could be at a place that you do nothing wrong, but still never do anything right. I'm going to say that again. Sometimes religious people are the best of this. They can be so focused on what they never do wrong, but they still don't get anything right done. Why? Because they're always on what they don't do wrong, what they never mistake in, how great they are and how good they are and what they've accomplished, but still miss the main and most important thing and still don't get it right. See, the rich young ruler, he began to ask Jesus, what must I do to have eternal life? When he just got through Jesus listing all these things, what somebody should not do, and they shouldn't do this, and they shouldn't do that. And the rich young ruler said, I've already am perfect in all those things. I don't do any of those things, but I still lack the one thing that you're talking about, and that is eternal life. Jesus answered this rich young ruler and said to him, go and sell everything you have and come and follow me. And the Bible says the rich young ruler turned and walked away very sad. And many scholars and many people come along and say, well, there you go. God isn't about you having riches. You're correct. He's more concerned about the riches having you. What many people miss in this story is this. When Jesus told the rich young ruler, when he began to list all the things that he don't do that, I don't do that wrong. If you're saying that, I don't do that, I don't do that. He began to list how good he is by all the wrong he doesn't do. And Jesus said, there's one thing you lack. 
and that is still eternal life. In other words, all those things don't get you eternal life. If you don't accept me as the Christ and the Savior of your life, then it doesn't matter how good you are, you're still not all in and you'll never be able to go all out. The Bible says the rich young ruler turned and walked away very sad. I was thinking about this. Why did he walk away sad? Obviously, he did not recognize the offer Jesus was making him. Jesus was only making him the same offer that he made all the other disciples. Not one disciple that Jesus said, come and follow me, got to bring anything they had acquired of themselves. None of them, Matthew the tax collector, he didn't get to keep his tax collecting business that he had going on and bring it and still be a tax collector. Peter being a fisherman, Peter didn't get, Jesus said, no, you leave your pole alone, you leave your fishing alone, you leave your career alone, I'm gonna now make you fisher of mankind. Here's why I think we miss it many times because we don't get consecrated. We don't get focused. We don't make a decision that I'm going to put my trust in you. Here, Jesus was giving an individual a chance of a lifetime. He said, get rid of everything that you've acquired of yourself. Get rid of it and come now and follow me. In other words, the rich young ruler turned Jesus down and left very sad. Jesus wasn't concerned about the things he had but he was concerned about the things that had him. What is that? See, the rich young ruler displayed to Jesus that his trust was more in his things than it will ever be in Jesus. He was asking Jesus, you're asking me to follow you, but I really need you to follow me. I am not getting rid of this stuff to follow you. This is what I've acquired. This is who I am. See, people think, oh, see, Jesus don't want you to have those things. They don't want you to be wealthy. No, no, no. His concern is, does it have you? Does it own you? Does it keep you from being all in and going all out? Do you let it talk to you more than God talking to you? What trumps your decisions you're making in life? Is your trust in your things or is your trust in God? I didn't mean for it to get so quiet in here, but y'all are like, oh, shoot dog, shoot dog. <laughs> Jesus went on to say to the disciples, he said, it would be easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than it would be for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God. See, everybody got tripped up and people still get tripped up because they're thinking that God don't want you to have the riches. He don't want you to have the things. He don't want you to acquire wealth. He don't want all that to happen. No, 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 no. Totally misunderstanding. But what he is concerned about are the things, the wealth and the riches and the pursuit of happiness in life. Does it have you? Is your trust more in that than it would ever be in God? Jesus went on to say there's not one man, not one person that's ever left their father, their mother, their land, their children for me and the gospel's sake that has not received in this lifetime a hundredfold return. Jesus went on to tell the disciples after the rich man walked away, he said, listen, there's nobody that gave up anything of any measure, of any stature, of any degree. There's nobody, not a man, not a woman, not a father, not a mother, not one person that's laid it all down for him and the gospel's sake. But then already receive it a hundredfold return in this lifetime. Not when you get to heaven, but here right now in my today. Not my tomorrow, but in my today. See, all Jesus was trying to tell the disciple, listen, if you'll come follow me, you'll get more wealth. 
You'll get true riches. You'll receive more than you could ever dream of. But he didn't, wasn't being unfair with a rich young ruler because everybody that Jesus asked to follow him, they had to lose sight of themselves. They had to disown themselves and they had to put all of their trust in God. In other words, he could not think that whatever he had to give up to follow Jesus, that Jesus wasn't big enough, good enough to return it back to him in a maximum return. All of us go through times where God is requiring our full, undivided devotion to him Put our trust in him. Take it off of everything, God, even if you got to do it every morning, every day, all day long. If you got investments, if you got stocks, you got a job, you got a career, and things start to crumble, things to start changing. If it causes you to get all worried and, oh, my God, and you want to put your head in the sand, you just don't act like nothing's going on. Listen, you have to be concerned. Where is my trust? How can I trust him with my eternity, but I can't trust him today? How can I put my trust in him when I die if I can't even trust him today? See, Jesus will never ask you and I to come and follow him without your best interest at the highest of his plan. The Bible says if I will seek first the kingdom of God and his way of doing things, then all those things things, they'll be added. See, one thing I've learned in following Jesus is if I will put him first, put my trust in him, go all in and be all out for him, all those things that matter, all those things that I need, all those desires, somehow he starts adding them in my life at the appropriate time. He'll give me what I need when I need it. If I don't need it yet, then he don't give it to me. But he always gives me what I need exactly when I need it. He is an on-time God uh, right here and right now, but it starts with today. It starts with my decision today. Is this helping anybody this morning? Come on, if it's helping you, give Jesus some praise. Food for thought. If Jesus is not Lord of all, then, he, then is he really Lord at all? I'll say it again. If Jesus is not Lord of all, then is he really Lord at all? Amen? I wrote this down. If Jesus hung on his cross, certainly we can carry ours. Jesus said, whoever wants to follow me, they must first have to deny themselves, lose sight of themselves, die to themselves, and pick up their cross and follow me. See, if Jesus could hang on his cross then he's not asking too much of me to pick up my cross and follow him. What is my cross? What would be your cross? Areas of sacrifice? Areas that you've had to die to? Maybe your own dream so you could really live his dream? Mainly your, only th your thoughts so you can now trust his thoughts? Maybe your way so you can now trust his way? Maybe it's, it's that wrestling that we go through in our life because when he's asking us to trust me in this, I know more than you know about this situation. I'm gonna turn this and work it out for your good. It may look nasty and it may look bad. It may look like you lost everything, but you're really not losing anything when you put your trust in me. You're not losing nothing because I'm a redeemer, I'm a healer, I'm a deliverer, and I'm gonna restore everything. Whatever you've lost, I'm gonna restore it and I'm gonna make it better than it was before. Joel chapter 2, I'm going to close with this, Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Did you get anything out of this? Give the Lord praise if you're getting anything. Joel chapter 2, if you look with me in verse 21, I'm going to read in the King James Version. It says, Fear not, O land, 
but be glad and rejoice. Somebody say, fear not, not. but be glad and rejoice. Why is it that God addresses what not to do before he tells me what to do? Could it be the what he tells me not to do interrupt what he's going to do? I'll say it again. Could it be that what he tells me not to do be a hindrance to what he's going to do or he needs me to do? All right, I'll go ahead and keep reading. I, I see you're excited about it. He says, but be glad and rejoice for the Lord will do great things. Is that in y'all's Bible? The Lord will do great things. For the Lord will do great things. He, he addresses this. Fear not, but be glad and start rejoicing because the Lord is about to do something great. Could it be that fear and causing me to shrink back causing me to doubt and get unfocused on my trusting in the Lord? Could it be that that fear could sabotage my desire, sabotage my faith, sabotage my trust in God? Verse 22 says, be not afraid of the beast of the field. Verse 23 says, be glad you children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause the rain to come down, the former and the latter rain to come down in the first month. In other words, he says, I'm not just going to give you rain for your dry season. I'm going to give you the latter rain and the former rain at the same time. You got to make sure that you don't get in fear. You don't get in worry. You don't get in doubt, but you put your trust in the Lord because I'm about to give you double for your trouble. Come on, somebody say amen. Double for my trouble. Verse 24 says, and the floors shall be full of wheat again and the vaults will overflow with wine and oil. Verse 25 says, and I will restore to you the years that the locust, the canker worm, the caterpillar worm, the pomegranate worm, the, he says, I will restore to you the years of everything that has come against you. See, I used to get so worried and so upset about lost years, lost time. Man, woulda, coulda, shoulda that I started missing the right here, right now. I know none of you have ever had those issues, but when I got a hold of this, God was saying, listen, I'm the God that does the great things, and I'm the God that will give you rain in due season. I will cause the lilies of the field to bloom and to blossom. I will cause the wheat to be full in your vaults. I will cause everything to overflow in your life. But I need you to fear not, but I need you to be glad and start rejoicing so I can do great things in your life. Come on, somebody. Would you stand with me all over this room? In other words, the Lord says, listen, I'm going to do such amazing things in your life. And he begins to list all the things there in Joel chapter 2, what he's going to do. And he tells them, listen, I'm going to restore all the years that the enemy has destroyed the fruit of your ground. Everything that's gone wrong, I'm going to restore the years. Anybody here other than me have any lost years? Come on, anybody here other than me has some lost time? Anybody here wish you would have, would have, could have, should have, you'd have done it right the first time or the second or the third? Anybody other than me, you feel like you've lost some time, lost some time in life, some time in God? Anybody here like me served God fully devoted, fully consecrated, and then fell off the wagon? backslid, was away from God for two to three years and then had to come back to God. Anybody other than me that felt like God could never forgive me, never restore me, never put me back again. Anybody here ever felt like you've totally destroyed everything that God ever had for you? You know, I went to rehab the first time, got saved. I mean, real saved. You know, that salvation experience that you have, like 
Oh my God, you're on so fire with God, you believe anything, literally anything could happen. Like it's just, I mean, amazing. And I went to got an opportunity to go smuggle Bibles into China, got arrested, and God delivered me, got me out of jail. I was in Haiti and I saw a witch doctor put a spell on somebody and caused an elephant, a, a man's leg turn into an elephant's leg. A witch doctor put a spell on there. Then I saw the missionary I was with go over and lay hands on that leg, curse that thing, and immediately that leg went back to normal. The man's body completely restored and miracle after miracle after miracle. People get out of wheelchairs that were lame, fully devoted. Then graduated and came back, was going into the ministry. It was over 28 years ago. I was going into the ministry. It was before I met Marla. I was, uh, graduated high school. And knew I was called of God. But then my dream fell apart right in front of me. And I turned my back on God. And for three years, I fell completely back. And it was seven times worse Exactly what the Bible says, the dog returning to its vomit. Never thought it would ever happen again. That ministry, that call of God, what God was going to, I blew it. I never ever, I just began to settle that I'll just go do this, I'll go do that. I'll never be who God intended me to be. But friend, what I'm telling you today is I know him. He's the Lord, my shepherd. He's my supplier. And the God that has supplied me, he will supply you. The God that restored me, he's a God that will restore you. He'll restore all the years that the enemy came and interrupted and destroyed your life. But here's the decision we can make. We have to make. Either we're going to put all our trust in all of our wrong, or we're going to put all of our trust in all of his right. I'm going to say it again. Either I'm going to put all my trust and all my wrong, all my discomforts, all my that I've done wrong, or I'm going to put all my trust in his right. See, it's his right standing. It's his right position that I won't allow to be in my life. I'm putting my trust in the Lord. And I'm declaring to you today that between now and the end of this year, God is going to give you double for your trouble, He's going to give you a double portion of rain in your season. Everything that's withered is going to produce and going to multiply and going to increase if you'll receive it today. If you'll get your trust off what you've been having your trust in, what you thought was the answer, what you thought was going to make it all better. Say, God, now I'm putting it in you. I'll never be disappointed in my life again because my trust is in you. If it don't work out in my time, I know it'll work out in your time. See, what I thought could never happen is happening today. What I thought I'd never be able to fulfill, I'm walking in it today. Because I had to get my eyes off, put my trust in me. It's put my trust in him. And I declare to you today that God's going to restore years of lost years and lost time. Times that you were in and you were out. You were devoted and then undevoted. But God says, I'm going to restore all that lost time. I'm going to set the record straight. I'm going to put it back better than it ever was. You haven't missed anything. You've not lost out on nothing. I just need you to separate and consecrate yourself and get fully devoted in me and my plan. And I really hear the Lord saying this today through me to you. There's many in this room today. The God is saying today, I need you to come and follow me. It's not right that I follow you. I need you to turn and follow me. I'll give you back anything that it cost you. I'll restore everything that you have to lose sight of. I'll put it back better than it was before. In the name of Jesus.